Okay. So uh, and, and apologies, Doctor Nagwa. Okay. So I am sharing. No problem. I've. I've... We are the older. Go ahead. Older means you will be, and then. Uh, Gonzalo after you? Yes. Okay. And um, is any, are you guys able to see my PowerPoint presentation? Yes, 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 we can. Okay, great. Okay, then I'm just going to go ahead and start. Um, so um, my talk is Preserving his, Her Story, Legendary Woman of Ancient Mesopotamia. The land of milk and honey, known as ancient Mesopotamia and the cradle of civilization, is the setting for much of the Old Testament, including the Garden of Eden, the birth of Adam and Eve, and Prophet Abraham. Some of the most significant developments or inventions credited to the Mesopotamians include writing, the wheel, agriculture, beer, sailboats, irrigation, and separation of time into hours, minutes, and seconds, basically the clock. Many firsts were discovered there, laws, contracts, written music, mitigation, mathematics, astronomy, and much more. A great number of stories and creations come from that region, but up until the last hundred years or so, it seemed as if the men had single-handedly built the civilization that influenced the city-states as we know it today. What role did women play in the building of this great empire that gifted us with our modern day lifestyle? I discovered the answers to these questions while writing my 13th book, Mesopotamian Goddesses, where I also investigated my ancient Chaldean roots. In my research, I learned um, about the legendary women of that region and the strategic process that caused their extinction. Their stories were buried for thousands of years and only began to resurface when archeologists dug them up about a hundred years ago. Yet these women are still so obscured by the hostile political and religious environment of the Middle East that most people are not aware of their existence. Um, so this, what happened was that there were small figurines Small figurines and other artifacts surfaced that proved um, that thousands of years ago, women had powerful role, roles outside the house. Women were very present in the archaeological record, but then start to, disip to disappear once prehistory turns into history. We are going to start, I'm going to just uh, focus on some of the women here. This one is my favorite, and Hadwana. So in 1927, British archaeologist Sir Leonard Woolley discovered the Enhadwana disk in excavation of the Sumerian city of Ur. Enhadwana was a princess. She was the daughter of um, Sargon the Great. Um, so she was a princess, she was a priestess, and she's the first recorded writer in history. Not male or female, just the first recorded writer. And how that happened is um, it's not that she was the first to ever write anything, but she decided that she wanted to make history. So at the end of her poetry, she signed her name. Um, she said, my king, something has been created that no one else has created before me. And so there was a name associated with her poetry. And it was the first time that a writer writes in the I voice, like uh, take authority of their writing and rather than write in third person. Um, and Hadwana, she taught about three centuries before the earliest Sanskrit text, 2000 years before Aristotle and 1700 years before Confucius. She is dubbed the Shakespeare of Sumerian literature and had a considerable political and religious role um, in Ur, which is in Southern Iraq. There she is. This is part of the desk and she has her entourage with her. So, but that's it. She's like in the middle of the engraving. Um, she wrote during the rise of the agricultural civilization when gathering territory and wealth, warfare and patriarchy were making their uh, marks. Uh, after her father's death, the new ruler of Ur removed her from her position as high priestess. Uh, she turned to the goddess Ainana to regain her position through writing a poem. 
Uh, and had Wana lived at a time of rising patriarchy, it has been written that as secular males acquired more power, religious beliefs had evolved, um, that had evolved from what was probably a central female deity in Neolithic times to a central male deity by the Bronze Age. Female power and freedom sharply diminished during the Assyrian era, the period in which the first evidence of laws requiring the public veiling of elite women was made. Okay, the next um, woman I have on my list is Queen Kobaba. She is the only woman among the heaps of monarchs whose names are on the Sumerian king list. She was a successful businesswoman as a tavern keeper, and she was also successful as a queen. The king list says that she made, uh, she made firm the foundation of Kish, meaning she protected it against invaders and made it strong. After Kish was defeated, uh, the gods decided to remove kinship from the city and take it to the city of Akshak. Story has it that Kubaba then went back to being the ill wife of feeding local fishermen who lived near her house. Kubaba's kindness caused the god Marduk to give her royal dominion of all lands. In later generations, Mesopotamians decided it was unnatural for women to uphold traditional roles for men and provided this omen to make sure no other woman dares to improperly cross that line again. If an androgyny is born, omen of Kobaba who ruled the country, the country of the king shall be ruined. They suddenly saw this as violating the natural order of things. People felt that Kobaba improperly crossed a boundary and surpassed gender divisions. In another omen reading, if a patient's lung didn't look so good, it was also the sign of Kubaba who seized the kingship. Kubaba was later worshipped as a goddess. Um, shrines in her honor spread throughout. Relief carvings show her seated, wearing a headdress and holding probably a mirror or, um, or a pomegranate. Uh, while at first her cult spread across the nations, eventually her presence disappeared and the country of the king was evidently ruined because of her absence, unfortunately. And that's Kubaba here. Let's try to see if this can cooperate with me. Hmm. Seems like we're having a lot of um, issues. I can continue reading and then um, I can check back with my PowerPoint presentation. Um, the next person, um, next powerful woman in ancient Mesopotamia was Gula, the great healer. There we go. Let me see if there was anything else about Kobaba. Yes, uh, just the part that I already read. Okay. Uh, so Gula, initially Gula was a Sumerian deity known as Ba or Baba, goddess of dogs. Gula's cylinder seals portray her always with a dog, sometimes seated and surrounded by stars. Dog figurines, um, Dog figurines dedicated to the goddess were found in the Kasai temple at Isin and in temples at other Babylonian sites. People noticed that when dogs licked their sores, they seemed to heal faster. And so dogs became associated with healing and Bewa transformed into a healing deity. As her worship spread across Sumer and the empire uh, region of Mesopotamia, she became known as Gula, the great healer. Uh, Gula's ch children included two sons and a daughter, all healing entity uh, deities. Um, Duma, the chief Sumerian god of healing, combined the mystical her son combined the mystical and scientific tactics of healing to cure illness. Associated with transformation and transition, he's often mentioned with his mother Gula, the supreme healer, and chance for healing. Uh, Damu was thought to be the 
intercessor through which her power reached physicians. Her other son, Ninazu, who carried a rod entwined with serpents, was linked with serpents, the underworld, and healing. This symbol was adopted by the Egyptians, later the Greeks, and today one sees the Caduceus as um, in doctor's offices and medical practices around the world as a sign of Hippocrates, Hippocrates the father of medicine. Uh, a cult center for Gula, uh, the city of Isin, is thought to have served as a training center for physicians who were then assigned to temples in different cities as needed. Doctors usually made house calls, but also treated patients at the temples. Women and men could be both be doctors, with more female physicians in summer, um, summer than elsewhere. Medical books from the library of Asher Penabal uh, indicate that doctors had a remarkable amount of medical knowledge and applied this repeatedly in caring for their patients and appeasing the gods and the spirits of the dead. Uh, people accredited this knowledge to Gula as a, gift from, as a gift from the gods, so they regularly called upon her for help with uh, conception, through writings, and some infertility, particularly when they felt that a supernatural spirit was interfering. She oftentimes was able to restore the person to health. The status of female deities began to diminish during the reign of Hammurabi and afterward when male gods dominated the religious arena. That wasn't the case with Gula, however, whose worship remained with the same respect. Adoration of Gula continued well into the Christian period and in the Near East, Gula was a, as prevalent um, as many well-known divinities. Her cult declined little by little until by the end of the first millennium, she had been forgotten. And the last uh, person that I brought up, although she was still during the time when um, Iraq was called Mesopotamia, but she's more like the modern um, woman. So it's not from ancient Mesopotamia, but I wanted to include her. And her name is Maria Teresa Esmar. And I include her because she was born in, my, in the village where my, both my parents are from, which is unfortunately has been destroyed um, since then. Maria Teresa Esmar was born in 1804 in Tilkepe and was the author of Memoirs of a Babylonian Princess, um, which was originally published in Great Britain in 1844. The book consists of two volumes and seven, uh, 720 pages and describes Esmar's travels through the Middle East and Europe. But this gem of a book was practically buried into oblivion among her people. In her book, Esmar talks about living as a Christian whose father was a priest during the Ottoman Empire ruling in Iraq. Uh, the reason Esmar went to Europe in the first place was because she thought Christianity was there. But after going to Rome and meeting with the Pope, her hopes were ruined. Um, she saw that Rome takes advantage of people and steals others' treasures. And meanwhile, the church in her village was not very happy with her either, uh, as she had convinced them to let her go to Rome in the first place in order to enter a convent. And then she never entered a convent. Although very um, religious and proud to belong to a religious family, Esmar did not look at the religion of Islam as an enemy, but as a friend. Uh, she was also very proud of her heritage and continued to wear her tilkia outfits wherever she went. She was a courageous and intelligent woman who spoke Kurdish, Persian, Arabic, and Aramaic at home and learned English and French to, during her 12-year stay in Lebanon and Italian um, during her four years stay in Italy or Rome. It is not known uh, when she wrote the memoirs or in what language. There's her book. Um, as the original manuscript has not been yet found, but they were first printed in 1844 in London and sold so well that there were reprints. One of the reasons for the memoir's success was because of the title. In 1760, the French writer Voltaire wrote a beautiful and internationally famous story called The Princess of Babylon. Uh, Esmar took that name because she was smart and she knew how to market herself and it worked. 
Esmar met with a number of aristocrats, many of whom sympathized with her. Um, Queen Victoria of England even sponsored her, and Esmar mentions uh, Queen Victoria in her acknowledgments in the book. People in England valued her work for a while, and while her people forgot her, uh, the Americans did not. They placed her in a book that was published in 1921 as one of the most important figures of the 19th century. And in 2002, as, near, um, as nearly her 20th birthday, people once again reprinted her book. Uh, Esmar paid close attention to women's issues and fought for their rights. Her main concerns were education, equality, and respect between the sexes. She even once set up a school in Baghdad for women and welcomed with open arms Western Christian British missionaries who then bribed the Turkish government to give them the license for the school and threatened Esmar to leave the school. She ran away and took refuge with the Muslim Bedouins for six months. She wrote about that experience, recording their daily lives every day from the weddings and celebrations and childbearing to their assaults on, their, on other tribes in great details. In her writing, she considered the Bedouin women to be the most beautiful and powerful women. Esmar herself never married, nor does she mention having had any intimate relationships. No one really knows when she died, as no birth certificate has yet been found. But it is said that her corpse was sent, as she'd requested, to Tilkev. But again, there is no um, definite proof of that. Um, what is for certain is that Maria Teresa Esmar was a woman that was talented, sophisticated, and ahead of her time. Conclusion. So the list of Mesopotamian female deities, queens, priestesses, and influencers is long. It's obvious from the position they had in ancient Mesopotamia that early on women were, were respected and highly visible. Unfortunately, their participation in the building of the cradle of civilization was omitted from our mythology until their stories resurfaced in the late 19th century through a series of cuneiform fragments. This omission has had dire consequences on our world, especially for our daughters who rarely get a chance to view a version of themselves that's not, uh, that's relatable and inspirational rather than stereotyped and pigeonholed. Uh, the good news is that women who have closely studied the archeological discoveries, who started to receive and enjoy more rights, have begun to disagree with the man-concentrated vision of the world, including the biblical story about the beginning of life on earth, that Adam birthed Eve from his rib, a story which gave the power and sacredness of her female sexuality as a giver of birth to the male gender. These women made sweeping shifts and many attempts to bring their feminine ancestral stories into memory, which in turn has helped them speak their lived reality. Whatever the reason had, um, that led to her demise, it's the responsibility of writers, educators, and filmmakers to end this omission and push our world into another more diverse and equal reality by bringing her story back to life. Thank you. And I just have some references here for anybody interested to. Um, I set my time and I think I didn't go past it. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Okay. So Thank you, Dr. Okay, we need we need to to clap, and uh, I must I must say something also about uh, 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 Miss um, uh, Nam Nam Namu. Um, we am Namu, uh, and that is uh, you know she was uh, uh, wonderful in uh, having arranged for me uh, an interview. Uh, that she actually posted, and we, I think we sent it to you, or we sent you a link. Uh, it was also, uh, there was also a text of this, the her questions and my answers, and I must say that I enjoyed thoroughly the interview, and I would like to thank her 
uh, publicly for uh, her thought and for her warmth and for her insightful uh, questions. So yeah. thank you very much. Uh, thank you, yeah. Dr. Um, All right. We've met so many wonderful women here. I hope I'll be um, in contact with them and, and there'll be similar opportunities. Um, okay. May I have a question? I, yeah. oh, can I take a All question? Right. Okay, go ahead. I'll take one question. Okay, thank you so much. It's a very powerful uh, paper. Uh, you try to give us like evidence we are not part of male body, you know, male's body. We are not part of the, 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 the man cage. So my question, because you uh, return back with the Anchidwana, Anchidwana. So there is like many, um, uh, what could I say, controversial ideas about this uh, figure. So some of them they said, uh, or said that uh, Anchidwana was in uh, isolation segregation because she had uh, a scabies. And that's why she started to- You had a what? Scabies, scabies. A baby? Scabies. Jut up, jut up. Oh, okay. yeah. You know what? I've never read that. Um, she is, uh, she's been a strong part of my work, aside from including her in this book, but I've been studying her for years. I've never read that. It was mostly political um, because of just, just like things happen now, even now with the presidency exchange. She has a piece of uh, uh, writing, she said, and I think Emily uh, Jaburi uh, has a collection of poems under this name. It means Anchidwana. And she considered herself uh, as Anchidwana. So that's why you did not mention that. You mentioned that. It was just a piece, right? She says in the poem, but that's because they threw her in a dungeon, basically. And she says, you have turned my sex into dust. Oh. Uh, does not deserve this, that they have ruined her. So she addresses it that physically you have done this to me, that you have turned my sex into dust, along with a lot of other things. And then she, in the poem that I mentioned, where she asks through a poem for the goddess and Hadwana, uh, to the goddess Inanna to rescue her. And they end up bringing her back into the temple, but she never regains her position. So it wasn't, there was nothing wrong with her physically until they put her in prison, imprisoned her. Then that's what things started going wrong with her. Oh, okay. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. We um, Nice job. Nice job. Love it. Love so, it. And now I am so excited to introduce you because you are from my hometown of Michigan in the United States. And plus, I know your parents. I love your parents so much. I knew them along before I met you. Um, and I just spoke with your mom like two, three weeks ago. I didn't even know you were part of this panel, but I will introduce you formally. <laughs> um, so, oh, I'm sorry. You yeah, maybe maybe for talking to me. <laughs> my, okay. Well, I'll skip that introduction when I get to you, and I'll just mention your name. But right now, we have Miss Gomez Haydar Jamshidi. She is um, from the University of Manitoba, Canada. And her talk is Hybrid Diasporic Identities as Cross-Border Peacemakers in Mourning in Jenin and Land of Dreams. Hi. Hi again. Thank you, uh, Wim. Thanks, everyone. So um, I'm, I'm trying to share my screen. Just please, I think it's better to just, I your slides are on. You need to just 